Hello and welcome to the Keyboard Chronicles, a podcast for keyboard players of the gigging variety. I'm your host, David Holloway, and I'm absolutely pumped to be here as always. And Paul, good to have you back. I'm excited too. Um, so for those of you that listened to part one of our Steve Nathan interview, I'm sure you're chomping at the bit to hear part two. Um, in part two, we delve even deeper into a lot of the artists that Steve's worked with and also cover off a lot of our standard questions with his fascinating insights in response to them. So um, hope you enjoy part two and we'll talk to you after the show. So I know you say you're semi-retired, but I, I noted you had at least four or maybe even more completed albums this year that you worked on. I mean, are you tending to do that remotely now rather than going into the studio? I'm doing a lot of remote. I, I don't know. Let's see. I did a Skip Ewing record or two this year. I did Keith Ford. So, I mean, these these are in-studio records. Um, yeah, but, you know, like a lot of, a lot of people, when COVID hit and... Somebody on the television kept saying, if you're elderly with an underlying condition, you need to stay out of here and whatever. So when COVID hit, I started staying home a lot, lot more. Um, and and when I would, when my guard started to go down and a, and a guy called and said, hey, we want to, we want to do so-and-so's record over at Quad Studios, uh, five days, three days, whatever it was, will you come and do it? And I knew I knew everybody in the band, and I thought, okay, I don't have to worry about anybody. They're all smart guys. So I took the record, and two weeks, two weeks after I'd spent three days sitting on a couch this close to a fellow musician, I find out he's unvaccinated and he's in the hospital fighting for his freaking life. He's on a ventilator. He's they don't think he's going to make it, and I he's this close to me. Mm whole time and that kind of freaked me out and it definitely freaked my wife out so since then I've stayed most almost completely out of the studios and and people will send me their tracks they'll you know they'll uh, uh, Dropbox or we transfer tracks and they'll go we trust you put piano on it put organ on it put synth on it put whatever put whatever you think it needs on it and send it back to us and they don't have to stand over my shoulder because they you know, I've I've proven myself to to kind of know what to do uh, over the years. So I I've, I've done a lot of that in the last couple of years. Yeah, it makes sense. Oh. So there you go. I've veered us off twice, Paul, but I'll throw back to you. No, that's uh, that's one hundred percent fine. And again, really really great reflections there on where things are heading. And our, our plan was to ask about that anyway and, and get your insights over over a long career. So thank you for sharing, Steve. Now this this. This podcast is international, and I think Dave, the, the majority of our listeners are, are US based, with 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 a good chunk from other parts of the world. But as Australians, we we do uh, have a vested interest in our own artists, and we would love to hear your reflections on on working with uh, Australian superstars such as uh, Olivia Newton-John, Keith Urban, Jimmy Barnes. So, uh, any thoughts for us there, Steve? Yeah, all good. All great artists, uh, every every one of them. Um, where do I where do I start? Uh, I, I you know I did I did some really good records with Keith Urban. Um, he's he's another person that another musician who who you could sort of read his drive to be successful, to be famous, uh, even to the point of where I, I felt like he was he was okay turning down a really great song if he felt that doesn't move me the way, the direction I want to go at this moment, at this time. He was very particular in guiding his career, but he was a great singer and a, great, a tremendous guitar player um, and fun to work with, if, uh, a, a terrific hang. I had as much fun hanging out at the lunch table with him as, as anything. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people... You know, when, when, when people randomly will st stop me and say, oh, I really like this record or that record or something you did, um, they all, uh, he had a song called Tonight I Want to Cry that I played piano on, and people will ask me about that one uh, a fair amount. I get asked about, I get, uh, asked about that. Um, I think that the, the top two, there's a Tim McGraw song called um, Something Like That. I get asked about that a ton. And there's a Mary Chapin Carpenter record, 
whenever you're ready, it's called. And that was, uh, I'm, I'm leaving Australia for a moment, but um, that was an interesting record in that we, um, we all flew to London to cut at Air Studio. George Massenberg was the engineer. Um, and she was not in a great place in her life at the moment. And she was unhappy. Um, she didn't, the record company had sort of pushed her to work with this producer and she wasn't thrilled about that. And she was, uh, she didn't feel well. She had jet lag as well. She was a little difficult. She was hard to get close to and a little difficult and demanding. And there were only two sort of ringers on the sessions, me and Glenn Wharf, the bass player, and everybody else were her employees, her band. And she was a little more comfortable being a little harsher to them. And it was a little difficult for us. Um, and it took a few days to start to, for the ice to melt a little bit. Um, and so we're working up this song whenever you're ready. And we've kind of run through it maybe two times, maybe three times. And we're, we're about to go ahead and cut it. And I don't know why exactly. I don't know what her thinking was. Um, but as the drummer starts to count it off, she goes, wait, wait, Steve, make something up in front of the intro. Go. Literally like that. And I just, OK. <laughs> so I just improvised something that was sort of influenced by the song I had learned that we were about to cut. And I, and I played it. and and made it obvious how to count the song off. We went into the song, and she loved it. She was a completely different person to me after that. And John Carroll, her piano player, told me, she made me learn that thing exactly, note for note, exactly the way you did. So uh, apparently it was, I don't know, I, it was better than I thought it was, because keyboard players, piano players, they, I'll run into them, and. and if they mention, I heard you on this or I heard you on that, that song comes up almost more than any other. So back to Australia, Steve. <laughs> I did Keith, Livy Newton-John, you, you, if you knew her, she couldn't be sweeter. She was just wonderful. Um, we had a lot of fun. We, we made some, some good music. She had, a, she had a manager who looked exactly like Bob Hoskins, I remember that, and I teased him about it a little bit. But yeah, she was great fun. She was, she was a lot of fun. Jimmy Barnes, I love Jimmy Barnes. He was my kind of singer. He had my, was my kind of attitude. Um, we played a lot of really cool old soul stuff that we didn't record or that didn't get on the record, and at the, end of the, at the end of the day, the record company took maybe four or five th of the things we cut and they made them put it out on a record with, they made them go into another studio and cut a bunch of old, you know, I think the only thing we had that, that he wanted to, that they were willing to keep, we cut it, we did a cut of Mustang Sally that was, that was pretty smoking. I know everybody hated Mustang Sally at that point, but this was a smoking, pretty smoking track. Um, but they, they, the record company decided you've cut too many obscure old R&B songs, old Dan Penn songs and Spooner Oldham songs, and they made them cut a bunch of, uh, the, of the chestnuts that everybody would know. And, and that was the, the way the record came out. But man, I loved Jimmy Barnes. I, lo I loved his singing. Um, uh, He's not the most obvious soul voice, Steve, but when he nails it, oh, he nails it. Yeah. No, he's got it. I mean, it, it's a unique soul voice because he's got that 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 really raspy, raw rock voice, but he loves soul music. I mean, that's what he would rather sing. Um, and, yeah, it's, and it's certainly his passion. And I'll tell you something as well, Steve, and uh, I, had, I have mentioned this to you on the, uh, the keyboard forum that we're both part of, but it's something that's really worth mentioning for our listeners and viewers as well. So... Uh, Jimmy's admiration of Steve is 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 uh, also very high. I, I've heard Jimmy Barnes interviewed. I was driving along in my car and I, 
I heard Jimmy interviewed about those sessions and he actually he mentioned you by name, Steve, and he said, oh, you know, I worked with all these great guys in America and it was such fun and they were amazing and Steve Nathan and he, you know, and he rattled off a couple of other names as well. So he certainly enjoyed that, that, that very much as well. And for, for those listeners and viewers that we have who are not from Australia, you may be going, who's Jimmy Barnes? In, in Australia, he is absolute rock and roll royalty. So a, a hugely successful artist here. He was lead singer of, um, what was his band? Uh... Cold Chisel, yeah. 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 yeah, who were a phenomenally yeah. popular band in Australia in the, uh, in, the, in the late 1970s. And uh, also was, then uh... went on to have a great rock and roll solo career. But as Steve said, his, his first love is soul music. And so he's, he's also had a little yeah. great success later in years cutting that yeah. music. And he's like a, he's a walking encyclopedia of obscure, great soul songs and soul records. He, he knows all that stuff. And Steve, um, there's another Nashville link. Our last guest was Ty Bailey, who um, plays in some bands with um, Jimmy's son um, and oh. does some stuff in Nashville. And um, Ty was very unconvinced Jimmy had any notoriety in Australia. Uh, he just thought it was his son talking up his father until he landed <laughs> in Australia and realised the, the reality of it. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, uh, I don't know. Do you know who Patterson Hood is? He was the leader of Drive By Truckers. Oh, yeah, you've yep. You've heard of them. Um, David Hood, the, the famous Muscle Shoals Swamper bass player, he, uh, he told me about 10 years ago, he goes, said, yeah, now, now I'm, I'm just Pat Hood's father. Nobody <laughs> knows who I am. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> No, great point. So, Steve, and um, we've only covered a small, tiny fraction of the artists that you've worked with. So, I just thought I wanted to to frame off that part of the interview with what um, who stood out for you over your career. Who's really stood out for you? I got to throw in Troy Casser Daly, right? Oh, he was of a course, I, I really, of course. He's a, he's a superb singer. He he's a really really strong singer. Um, so I had a lot of fun. I've done a couple of his records and. And those are always fun. I, I, I'm, I'm always going to be happier if you've got a real singer in the in the headphones. And as everybody knows, these days a lot of people get get record deals who aren't really singers, um, and the, they look great on camera. They got all the moves and the poses, and they sing okay. And you know you're going to tune them up and you're going to do whatever you can. But when you get when you get somebody like Troy in, in your headphones, or Olivia, um, Jimmy, um, I've, I've, I've been really fortunate to have some really, really great singers. And that just, that just makes your whole, your whole day, your whole gig better. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so Steve, across your whole career, who are the standouts for you that we haven't covered? Because I feel like, as I said, we've only covered a fraction. What, what are the highlights that you, we perhaps haven't covered off? Some of my, my favorite records ever were Trisha Yearwood's and Sarah Evans and uh, um, Leanne Womack's records. These are all just really superb singers, really, really great singers. Um, and, and the kind of artists who recognize, uh, who, who can tell a great song, a really well-constructed great song from a pretty good song. Uh, so. Uh, I've cut some really, really, really strong things. Winona Judd is a great singer. Um, she can be difficult at times, uh, to, depending on what's going on in her personal life, but she was always great to me, and she always s just sang her ass off in the phones. Um, I'm going to mention somebody you've never heard of, and you'll probably won't even be able to find. Um, Dave Bryce and... Um, and Mike Martin once asked me what was my favorite record I had done ever. And, and there are so many, but what popped into my head was a guy named Herb Jeffries. And you'll have to, you'll have to look him up because Herb Jeffries was, he sang with Duke Ellington in the 30s. Wow. Uh, he was 84 when I met him. And, we, and he cut his first record for Warner Western. Because in the, in the late 30s and 40s, Herb Jeffries was a singing star. He had a big hit with a song called Flamingo. And, and he, it struck him that on Saturday mornings, all the kids went to the movie theater to see 
that week's serial of a Western of some sort. And it bothered him that there were no black cowboys. So he created this character and he, and he made movies. But he cut a record with, with uh, Jim Ed Norman producing um, uh, for Warner Western. And it was a small budget and it, was, it wasn't direct to disc, but it might as well have been. Uh, it was called The Buckaroo Bonsai Rides Again. And, uh, and, and every song we cut on the record, we got one take that we didn't fix, we didn't take it, we didn't go, let's try it again. We did one take of each song, he sang them live, we played them, and if you made a mistake, too bad, it was on the record. Um, but Herb Jeffries was just the coolest guy I think I'd ever met. And he sang, he had this big, deep baritone, and he was singing these cowboy songs in, in just the coolest way, um, and, there was just something so exciting about hearing him singing, uh, playing these kind of simple, some of them even goofy songs, and knowing that you were, you were going to play and you didn't have that luxury that most studio players have of, hey, wait, let me go back and redo the bridge, or let me take that again, or, hey, I made a mistake in the second solo, can I punch that in? None of that. You just had to play. And so I got mistakes on there. All the players got mistakes on there. But there's a, there's just no, there's just nothing like adrenaline for, uh, it, it was just very exciting. And he was, he sang great. And he was just such a cool guy. Um, and he walked out of the vocal booth after one song and he, <laughs> And he walked over to me at the organ. I'm sitting behind the, my C2. He walks over to the organ after the take and he goes, son, I believe you got a little spook in your wood pile. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Uh, and Steve, apparently he was the bronze buckaroo, Google tells me. Yes, the bronze buckaroo. It was so much fun and, and I still listen to it to this day. Uh, it, my wife has it on, uh, on, has the CD in rotation in her car, and it never leaves. We listen to it all the time. It's just, it's one of those records that it just comes on and it makes me smile. It's not the same kind of smile as, 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 as something else, maybe. Um, and I've got, you know, I've got some records where, where the, the, the record really called for what I would call showing off, you know. It was, it was a record, I can't think of a good example maybe, but it was the kind of a record where hot playing was a part of, of moving the message forward. So I've got some records where I have a lot of fun and I'm whipping up and, you know, Lee Sklar said, you sound like you're rolling an orange up there on the, key, on the piano one time. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm typically the guy who's, who's thinking, my focus is almost is entirely on what does this record need? What does it need for me, for, for this artist to be successful communicating what they want to communicate? And if that means playing almost nothing, that's, that's what I should do. I listened to, um, I just had mentioned Mary Chapin Carpenter earlier. She has a, a song on the same record called The Dreaming Road. I, I might have played 15 notes on that record, but I, th chose every one of them very specifically to do something. And, and I let the synth pad move the record where it needed to go without ever getting in front of uh, or competing with her lyrics, which were the, what, what mattered on that thing. Um, so yeah, it's a different focus. Yeah, I suppose the playing has to really serve the song. It's what it boils yeah. down to one way or the other. Uh, so, so Steve, we we ask all our guests to regale us with a, a story of a of a technical or musical train wreck that's particularly memorable to them because perfection's boring. Uh, do you, do oh. you have a do you have a story for us? A train wreck. I've got a couple, I think. Um, they were it's funny. They were both live, playing live, which I almost I, I've done very very little live playing in my life. Um, 
One was, one was uh, there was a tribute, when Danny Gatton passed away, uh, some folks organized a, a tribute show to raise money for his daughter's college education. And, and I, went to, uh, to, I went to Washington, D.C. with uh, Brent Mason and Paul Franklin, I think Eddie Bears and Michael Rhodes. And uh, on the second night, we were, uh, we, got, we were to play a little bit. And I don't know how familiar you are with Brent Mason, but he has a song that, he, that he's famous for called Hot Wired. And it's like just blinding at 198 beats per minute or whatever. But the first night we were there, we went out hard. We went out and partied really, really hard that night. And, and we're, I was pretty sick the next day, as were most of the other band members. So I think somebody recorded us playing Hot Wired, and my solo was so bad that when my wife heard the recording, she said, Steve, did you fall off the bench? <laughs> that was pretty awful. The one I was, uh, well, I'll go ahead and tell it. The, the one that first came to mind, um, I did some records with Tony Joe White, who was famous for uh, Poke Salad Annie and writing Rainy Night in Georgia and a few other things. Um, he made, he's a great songwriter. He was a great songwriter. I did a few records with him. Always fun, always really sort of deep, soulful music. And he'd written this song, Closer to the Truth, that it was a big, important ballad to him. And it was, it had, it had this huge sort of orchestrated all me synthesizer intro. And it was all elaborate and, you know, and it was not, not, not something I was sort of typically known for, but I did, you know, I did a lot of it. Back, back in the day, I did a lot of those people would say, well, can you do a, like a orchestra, string orchestra, something, something, and I would make things up, do a lot of that one pass kind of thing. So I've got this elaborate big synth intro that's all busy and I'm like Rick Wakeman up there playing all these things and then it builds and the, and the idea is that it builds and then this big chord comes up and it builds to this big fevered pitch and then it just hangs there and then Tony strikes the chord on his guitar and starts the song. Well, he's called me because uh, a French television station wants to come in and do a, a like a documentary on them, and they want to record them playing live. Would I come and play live with them? So it's me and a couple of other guys that he knows and him, and he wants to do this song, and I build it up, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I get all it, and I finally I get it, and I'm hanging that big ass chord out there waiting for him, only I've kicked it off a half a step off. So then when he hits his chord, <laughs> It's just like clash to freaking see. And he just looked at me with a look that I wanted to crawl under that organ. I mean, I just, uh, we had, to, he, he made them stop the TV cameras and we had to start it all over. But it was, it was, uh, it was definitely a train wreck in, in full view of a full audience and television cameras. <laughs> yeah. If only that footage was on YouTube somewhere, Steve. Oh yeah, yeah, maybe it is. Who knows? And I've had, um, you know, everybody, everybody who works with uh, synth gear and that has, will have stories of gear failure, or, um, you know, you're on the session and everybody's waiting for you, and for some reason there's no sound coming out of the one synth you really need for this song. And I, I, I got tons of those things. That, that, that happened a lot. And I still, even to this day, I still, if I, if I eat something too spicy or whatever or too late, I'll have a dream where I'm on a session and everybody's waiting and, and they're all, you know, they're all pointing at their watches or tapping their foot. And I'm over there and I can't figure out why doesn't this work and why isn't, and what, where's, where's my keyboard? Why isn't that over here where it's supposed to be? And, and then there's this long cable that goes into another room and I'm, you know, I, I have those sort of dreams. 
I, I think we all have those dreams. I have them too. I, I have that recurring dream where I turn up to a gig and, and I don't know any of the parts. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible. Yeah. Uh, Steve, something else we always uh, love to ask our guests, uh, particularly people with, with uh, uh, long and successful careers, is what you have had and are still having. Tips, things you've learned that you would pass on to uh, other keyboard players, the important things you've learned that are, that are worth knowing. Um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, listening is the most important thing. Paying attention and listening, and 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 I think I've already covered this. Uh, knowing that, uh, you know, you're not there to sh you're not there to show your ass to the world. You're not there to, you know, to uh, shoehorn something that makes you look good onto somebody else's record. Um, and that happens. I mean, there are there are, there is a lot of there are some successful, really successful players, who approach record making with, hmm, what could I do that will make me look good, um, and I, I think you know that's just a shame. But um, yeah, it's you know it's paying attention. I won't. I'm not the guy who's going to tell you, uh, show up 20 minutes early and do this and do that because I was late to every session I probably ever went to. Um, and I did find, over the years, I found that um, if you're if you're really good at the job, uh, people want you, even even if they know you're going to be 15 minutes late, or even if they think you're kind of an asshole, and and you got a bad personality, the, people would rather work with great talent who's really easy to get along with and and fun to get along with, but if it comes down to a choice between somebody who's a dick who really can play it great versus somebody who's a lot of fun to hang around with but isn't really going to light any fires, they're going to take the dick. You know, they're, they're going to hire that person. Um, I used to work in Atlanta with a piano player named Oliver Wells. He was a minimum of an hour late to every session I ever did with him. But holy crap did he play great when he got there. And so... He had a career. He was he he was just just that good, um, you know. And there there've been some there've been some guitar players with a with a lot of attitude. Some of that goes with the territory. And then there's this you know. There's also a I don't know if this is a tip or not, but you have to you have to be able to read the room and you have to recognize at some point. Um, am I of value? Am I bringing value to these people? Um, do I have what they want? And 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 I, I guess I'm saying this because for for years I've seen musicians sort of come and go, who are terrific musicians. They play great. They understand making the record great, but they're forever going. Was that okay? I, I, I don't know. Did I do? Did you? Do you want me to do this instead? I could do that. And they're 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 just timid. And there's a point at which you you have to kind of realize, you're you're often working for people who don't really know either. And there's a point at which they're going to become more comfortable and happier, if you are the guy who goes. That's what you need. Yeah. All right. There it is. I gave it to you. Here you go. Um, confidence is you know if you if you do it right you should be you should be proud of what you did and, and be confident not that not that you need a pat on the back or you, you need uh, you know reassurance or anything but um, don't undercut your own worth uh, uh, trying to uh, don't, don't, don't spend your whole time trying to figure out did they want this do they want that uh, sometimes it's just you just need to show them. What well, I think this will make your record better, and here it is. And they and for the most part they they like that. They're they're happier. You've you've given them value in uh, in a shorter amount of time. That's a great yeah, great tip, and both those are, are excellent tips. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. My first time I worked for Barry Beckett, I was a, I was the new guy in Muscle Shoals, um, and. Like I said, Rick had hired me, and then I got hired at uh, 
uh, you know, Pete Carr hired me to play on his record. So the word was getting around. So Barry Beckett, who was a brilliant, brilliant player and a great producer and, and somebody I, I deeply admired, he start, he's heard about me. So he goes, all right, I want to hear this kid. So he, he picks the next uh, Muscle Shoals Sound publishing company demo session uh, where they're going to cut demos on six songs or whatever. And he hires me. And he makes me come into his office at a time to make sure I can read a number chart and a few things like that. But he hires me to play, and I play. Um, and at the end of the date, I just asked him. I went right out. I said, well, how'd I do? And he said, and this was maybe the best advice for a studio musician I ever got. He said, you did fine. You did really fine. If I, if I had one piece of advice for you, it would be, don't stick so close to the chart. And yeah, and so for years, I, you know, if there was a choice between me and a guy who kept his head down and his elbows in and only played what it said on the paper, I got the gigs, so. Yeah, no, that's, sorry, yeah, that's a superb um, piece of advice and that translates well into the live arena as well. Um, yeah. I think, yeah, that's brilliant, so no, thank you. Um, and um, Steve, we, we, we're not a tech-focused podcast, and given the variety of your career, I'm not, I'm not going to dig too deep into keyboards themselves, but what, what sort of are your go-to keyboards now when a, a project comes up, including probably what's sitting behind you? What, what are the things that you just, I'm assuming it's things like the Whirly and the B3 and, and stuff like that, but yeah, what, what are your staples? Well, you know, I, I mean, for years I carried... I got to Muscle Shoals, again, like I said, I was the new guy and, and trying to get work, and I, this was 1977, I think, and as I'm sitting around thinking, I, you know, I might get into these studios, um, I, I, I should up my game a little bit, and I remember I said, they got these things called synthesizers, I should get one, nobody has one here, and I remember I ordered an Oberheim 4 voice through the you know, through the mail or whatever, you know, to be delivered. And I got it, and it sounded good, but I was, f I was frustrated because it didn't remember anything. You, you, couldn't, you couldn't come back the next day and, and start at, the, at, at, you know, the same place. It didn't have any presets or patch memory. And I went, eh, I don't know about this. What about this other one I see here, the, this Prophet 5 thing? So I sent the Oberheim 4 voice back, <laughs> which in hindsight I regret, but I sent it back um, and I ordered a Rev2 Profit. Well, they only had Rev2 Profits then. And suddenly I was this new guy who not only could he play the piano and the organ and the Wurlitzer and the Rhodes, but he had this box, he had this thing and it could sometimes it could sound like strings and sometimes it could sound like these other things that that we hear on pop radio and and it, it sort of helped open the door for me because um, none of the none of the other keyboard players here were, were playing it eventually Randy McCormick bought an ARP he bought an ARP string machine and I think I had I bought an Elka string machine at that point and we did a lot of dates where where Barry would hire both of us because he, th he liked the combination of the two playing playing his fake string parts um, and then I, you know, I started buying keyboards and collecting things. I don't know if you ever seen. I had, uh, at the height of it, I carried a 44 space rack and a 22 space rack, wow. plus uh, a, a Hammond, a Leslie, a Wurlitzer, a, a Fender concert amp for the Wurlitzer. I had an ultimate stand with three full boards uh, with like a, a an 88. Uh, it was an Elka controller at one point, then I had a PV on it at, later. Um, I had everything from Tritons and Karmas, and you know, I, had, I was a Korg endorser, and they were always sending me stuff. Um, I had the guts of a Mini Moog up on the top of it, because I'd had it, uh, I had some guy separate it from the keyboard and, and connect it to a, a module so I could drive it with MIDI. So I carried all, all that stuff. Um, and now I have almost none of that. I, uh, you know, um, I've, I've been working almost entirely in the box, even, even pre-COVID. Um, I found that I would carry the computer 
to the sessions and set it on top of that giant rack full of rack modules. Um, and nine times out of 10, I found what I, want, what I wanted faster on the computer than I did in the, in the rack. Um, you know, and, and after, over time I started, you know, th there was a software replacement for everything that was in the rack. Um, and, it, you know, it helped that I was doing, uh, I was doing country pop and soul and R&B. So, uh, you know, I wasn't doing any prog, I wasn't doing any, uh, any really sort of progressive pop music. So I wasn't frequently called on to create really synthy synth sounds. So I was less dependent on my JD990 or my, uh, you know, whatever I had in hardware boards. I was much less dependent on them. Um, I did make up some sounds from those boards back, you know, years and years ago that I've never been able to remember how I made them and I've never been able to imitate them exactly with, with software or whatever my current hardware was. but. I remember there was a, I did a record with Mick DeVille, and um, he has a cut called Italian Shoes. And I remember I did this, I did a sound in the intro that I played uh, with a breath controller, and I don't remember what synths I was using, but it was probably a DX and something else, but um, it was just a really kind of a cool sound. It didn't... It didn't sound exactly like a synth, and it, but it didn't sound like a, an organic instrument necessarily, but uh, it's, it's sort of one that got away. And I also, you know, I've, I've, I've had a philosophy pretty much my whole career of never, never going, ooh, this was a great sound that I used on this record. I'm going to be sure and save that so I can use that on this other record another day. I went exactly the other direction. I made sure that if I liked the sound that I had, I made sure that I saved sort of the, the basic framework from which I built that sound, but I never saved anything so I could use it again. Um, I, I sort of prided myself on when I needed to, to program sounds for a session, I was always going to sort of go, you know, bring up some building blocks that, would, that I knew would get me uh, close and then proceed to find, find uh, an individual sound for each record. Yeah, great approach. No, that keeps it fresh too. No, that's excellent. Um, Steve, another standard question, and I think you actually may have answered this before we started recording partly, and that's where we ask um, our guests to tag other keyboard players they would love uh, to hear interviewed on their career. So you you definitely mentioned an Australian person that we, we are chasing, and that's Ray Thistlethwaite. Oh, yeah. Thistlethwaite. Um, yeah, but well, he um, goes by Sun Ray now, doesn't he? I think in some yeah, and he I know he was just out in America touring with was it Steve Vai? Anyway, he was he was doing something recently, and he's he's yeah iconic in Australia as well. But anyone else, Steve, that you go, well, gee, I'd love to hear about their career. Well, I mean, obviously, if you could get Matt Rollins, uh, he would be great. Um, I think Gordon Moat would be an interesting interview. Um, uh, you know, he's more of a piano player and a piano and organ player and not not so much a synth gear guy, but he, he can certainly get his way around. Um, and and a guy here in town named Dave Cohn, who's, he's sort of risen to be, the, he's the current sort of top of the A-team keyboard player here. And he's a hardware guy. He's absolutely a hardware guy. He, he does not like to, he likes to, carry, you know, stands and boards and he's got Mellotrons and old analogs and all this stuff and he approaches every record turning knobs and finding sounds. Uh, he's a fascinating guy. He's a great, great, great player. Great organ player too. Great. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch here. Um, I, I, you know, you've, you've done so many. Um, I mean, they're three brilliant suggestions, Steve. That, they're certainly yeah. all noted. Yeah. I, you know, you could try try getting uh, Reese Winans to talk. I think he'll talk. He can he can be kind of a crusty guy, um, but he's got some great stories to tell. And what a player, man! Yeah, what a player! Absolutely. And then uh, we saved the best to last. The Desert Island Disc question, Steve. Five albums that you know really rank high um, over your lifetime. So not not necessarily ones you've worked on, but just five albums that you you, 
if not couldn't live without, you know, would miss if they weren't there. Wow. Uh, that's a tough one, but I, w I, I would put Donny Hathaway live on at the top. I, I, I definitely at the, at the very top with with the, the Donny Hathaway would be the Ray Charles genius plus soul equals jazz. Um, and, and then I, I might make the next three all Ray Charles compilations, but that's probably cheating. Um, <laughs> I, somebody was once grilling me about, um, about Steely Dan. They were complete Steely Dan freaks. Um, and they went on, they were going on and on about how great this was here and that great that was there. And I like, I like Steely Dan. I, I've liked every, every one of those records. But I remember I said to him, and this is how long ago it was, I said, well, I, I, I do like Steely Dan, but I'm not going to take Ray Charles off my, pod, uh, my iPod to make room for him. <laughs> so, um, the, the, if I, you know, the other records that seem to be popping into my head are, were, you know, from my childhood. I, I, loved, um, uh, I loved the Ray Bryant Little Susie record and Bobby Timmons' This Here, That There. And I know I'd take Herb Jeffries record there because I listen to that all the time. Oh, there you go. There's your fifth. Herb Jeffries is oh, your fifth. That's five. You've done well. That's good. No, no, you've done okay. better than most. Um, so no, that's excellent, Steve. And um, okay. look, we can't we can't thank you enough for taking the time. And if ever there was um, an appropriate um, application of the the phrase, we've only barely scratched the surface. It's it's in the the context of this interview and you mentioned Lee Sklar before if ever there is someone else that should be doing a daily YouTube update like Lee does it should be you Steve I reckon you could get through at least a couple of hundred episodes uh, and they'd all be fascinating so we ca yeah, can't thank you enough for taking the time and perhaps we may have to follow up with you at some stage in the future I had a lot of fun And there ends part two of the Steve Nathan interview. Um, I know we talked about it right back in the introduction to part one, um, Paul, but that was just bloody amazing, really. Yeah, I mean, as, as I said when we did the intro, that was a lot of fun. Steve's a great guy. And what hasn't he done, David? That's right. As I said, I think on the show, he should be doing a Lee Sklar daily update. Mm. Um, for those of you that haven't seen Leland Sklar's YouTube channel, I do highly recommend it. He has fascinating, in-depth insights on the thousands of sessions he's done, just like Steve. And I think Steve needs to be following suit. Um, so no, huge thanks to Steve Nathan for taking that time. It's it's hugely valued um, and, and it, you know, just fascinating insights. Um, so just very briefly before we go, this is obviously the last show for 2022. So can't thank you all of our listeners and viewers out there for your support. We've grown and gone from strength to strength this year, and that's because of you. Um, so cannot thank you enough. Um, and 2023 is looking like a big year as well. Um, we've got a few very exciting guests uh, already lined up. Uh, and lots more on the boil as well. So, yeah, watch this space, and we'll be obviously keeping you updated on that. Uh, and we also couldn't do it without our gold and silver supporters, uh, the wonderful brother Paul Brown from the Water Boys. Um, thank you, brother Paul, as always, for your support. Um, the brilliant Tammy Catcher of Tammy's Musical Stew. Um, again, if you want a really cool internet radio show um, to listen to that covers a whole range of genres and time periods, uh, Tammy's Musical Stew is the way to go. Uh, also, a big shout out, and Steve Nathan is a, a regular contributor on the musicplayer.com forums. There's a reason that they're, they're supporters of ours and we're supporters of musicplayer.com. It is a non-inflammatory, easygoing, fun environment to actually talk about the thing we all love, keyboards. And Paul and I have been members there for many years. I've been a member there for now, I think, Paul, 21 years. Yeah, you've been a member from almost its inception, just yeah. about having your day. Yeah, yeah, it had some iterations, but, yeah, the current iteration's sort of close to the beginning, yeah. But, um, yeah. So, yeah, Dave Bryce and the team at musicplayer.com, they're actually doing some really cool interactive reviews. So the new GX80 software, part soft synth plug-in, there's a brilliant um, interactive review going on there, and now it's getting a lot of attention and stuff. So anyway, enough. yeah, it's good. It's 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 uh, th those those um those interactive gear things are fantastic. They do yeah. now. 
So, um, yeah, no, really so huge good. shout out to musicplay.com forums. And then lastly, but definitely not least, Radio Grande, our other silver supporter. They're a YouTube channel devoted to bringing you funk and soul reimagined reimaginings of iconic songs. As you heard Steve Nathan say, there are some great Australian artists he's worked with. Uh, one of Australia's greatest singer-songwriters is Paul Kelly, and he has mm. a an iconic, I've used the word too many times in this outro, but he has an iconic Christmas song called How to Make Gravy. Well, Radio Grande have just released a brilliant funk reimagining of that song. So uh, whether you're an Aussie listener or not, you may enjoy that a great deal. So search for Radio Grande on YouTube and enjoy some wonderful music. So thank you to all our supporters. So we'll be back. We're, we're not taking time off over Christmas and New Year, are we, Paul? We're putting more shows in the can and bringing the best in the world to our listeners and viewers. We are taking no time off because we are committed to delivering you the best possible content and we love what we do and are you it's possible you're listening to this in early 2023 but I, yes. I just wanted to echo what what uh, what David said the I'm a little bit blown away David put together some stats for me the other day to show me how much this podcast has grown over the last 12 months and I mate I couldn't believe it when I when I read those numbers it's it's humbling thanks to every single person who listens or or watches and uh, like David said, we've already got some pretty cool guests lined up for next year and uh, love doing it. And I love working with you, David. You're a no, champion among know. men. No, thank you, sir. And the feeling is mutual. So we'll be back again in the next couple of weeks. Um, always feel free to keep in touch via the website, keyboardchronicles.com, the Facebook page, Keyboard Chronicles, at Twitter at the keyboard chr one We're still there in spite of Elon. We'll see whether we hang in. Um, we're on Instagram at the Keyboard Chronicles. And would you believe we're on TikTok? I don't know whether I mentioned that last. I think I did at the end of Ty Bailey to myself. But we're on TikTok and we, we, we believe it or not, put little short snippets from our interviews up on TikTok. Getting a few views. Look, we're with it. Who says we're not hip and happening? We're the, we're the coolest people. That's right. We know uh, what but, the cool young kids want. That's right. But you can't also beat a good old email at editor at keyboardchronicles.com. And uh, last but not least, again, our Patreon account, which is patreon.com forward slash keyboard chronicles. If you, for the price of a coffee a month, happy to, to chip in and help us keep this boat afloat. And you do get bonus content. So we've got a minimum of two bonus early access episodes happening for our Patreon subscribers. Um, and as we did before this show, we let our Patreon subscribers know which guests we've got upcoming. Are there any questions they would like asked and so on? So yeah, jump in there if you're interested. All right. That, I think that'll do us, Paul. Um, happy Festivus. And um, thank you all out there for listening. We'll see you back here next episode.